Welcome back to another amazing show on True That. We are so excited today. We have an amazing guest. But as you know, myself and Caroline, we hardly ever talk to each other. So we got to check in and see how each other's doing today. <laughs> how are you doing over there? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. What about you with your polka dot dress? Oh, you know what? I was just talking about this. I should have known better, better than to wear something. I thought I'd wear something a little different for you guys that are on the podcast and can't see. I'm kind of in my Southern country look today with my turquoise and I actually did make apple pie last night. So I know, right? I know. Did you believe that I, I do have a domestic- No, wait, style. wait, wait. Let's pause back two seconds. You made apple pie. Is there gluten in it? No. No. Okay. Is there sugar? No. Oh my gosh. So it's dairy free. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, it doesn't sound as attractive, but I'm glad. <laughs> good job. Okay. I'm going to send out the recipe to everybody. It's, and, and uh, it's very good. It's very good. I actually don't make the pie crust. I buy a gluten-free dairy-free pie crust. I know I do, but I make the filling. I make the filling and I, and I add the love. <laughs> okay. Okay, so tune in for our next cooking session in about two months. Uh, but for now, Deb, what are we talking about today? Well, actually, well, you know, I do know. Whoops, I do know, and I'm, I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to throw it at you this time instead of having it thrown at me. Um, well, today it's going to be a bit more of a serious subject uh, because we are not just only crazy or, or funny. We're also like deep sometimes, but... Um, we're talking about breaking free and breaking free can have a lot of different uh, meaning for different people. You know, it can be for little things. It can be for big things. It can be for things from things you see, and it can be from things you don't see. So I want to ask you, Deb, what is the most significant thing for you that you had to break free that created a big difference in your life? Wow. Are we doing a mini series? Because I think I could do a mini series. <laughs> right? We'll do it after the cooking show. Yeah. Okay. After the cooking show, we're doing a mini series on breaking free. So look, I mean, for me being a mind, body, spirit person, when I hear about breaking free, it's like breaking free from my own, you know, chains to life, my belief systems, the, the things that I thought were real and kept me in situations that were not healthy right? Um, those, so I had to do a lot of uh, breaking free of my own patterns, the way I thought about myself, my self-esteem, my self-value, all of that stuff. Um, Cause that's kind of, that was, that's probably the biggest piece for me, but there was a couple of times in my life was really profound and um, I'll share them with you. Cause again, we are getting a little, so I'll get kind of, I'll get real and transparent. So one of the biggest break frees that I ever had was Everyone that knows me knows how much I love music. And so I spent a large part of my life in the music industry um, doing the band thing and the nightclub thing and cocktail waitressing and bartending and managing clubs and all that kind of good stuff. Because honestly, I have a serious addiction to music and I am not prepared to go to a 12 step program about it yet. So I was in this kind of scene. I was in this environment. I was in this culture. And um, that culture, you know, has a fashion of it that's or a fraction of it that can be fairly unhealthy right not only the night nights with the bands and the relationships and there tends to be at least when I was in it quite a bit of drama and there was aspects of it that were pretty unhealthy right and so I had gone to a couple of funerals of people that were close to me and I was like man this this scene is getting pretty unhealthy it certainly wasn't breeding positivity and enlightenment. And I didn't even know what those were. I just knew that what was happening around me wasn't cool. Um, and I was way too young to be going to that many funerals and watching that much drama. And so I literally, you know, went to work. And when I went to work, I didn't get off work till 2.33 in the morning when we left the club. And then we went to go have dinner, just kind of like anyone else would when they finished work. So, you know, I'm getting home at four or five in the morning. And I went into the bathroom to kind of like brush my teeth and call it a night. And you know, we'd all kind of gone out after work and done our thing. And literally I'm standing in front of the mirror. And this is kind of what I call my, like, it was like the most pinnacle piece uh, of change for me. And I looked in the mirror and the mirror literally went black. Like I could not see myself. I could not see myself. 
And it was, it could have been three seconds, 30 seconds, but it felt like it was like 10 minutes. I was like, I could feel this panic of not being able to see myself. And then all of a sudden I saw myself in the mirror and what happened, I don't know, but it scared me enough to call my boss the next day and go, I'm not coming into work today. And I was of course working the club and he's like, oh, so you're sick or something. I'm like, no, like I'm, I'm just never coming back. And he goes, what? And I'm like, I know, I don't know. I'm just never coming back. I need to change something. And I literally went from that scene and, and got involved in personal development. And that's when I kind of started to take a look at my life and what was happening and why it was happening and exploring my childhood and la, 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 Who knew that journey was going to be what it was? But that was breaking free from an environment that I felt comfortable in until I didn't feel comfortable. And I had no idea where it would take me. I just knew I had to, I just knew I couldn't go back. And I think, you know, the big thing here on the head is that a part of breaking free that is so scary is that no matter if you're going for better or worse, you don't know where you're going. You're leaving your comfort zone. You're leaving your known space. You're jumping into a black hole basically and being like, okay, you know, so um, I say that because I hear quite often in, in a lot of different situations and because that applies for a lot of different situations, but we'll, we'll watch someone going through something and I'm bad with that. Like I ache thinking, well, just put an end to this situation or change this or change that or leave him or stop drinking. You know, you have, you have all the solution for the person and we don't understand why the person doesn't make that move. And one of the biggest reasons I think is the fear, the fear of jumping in that black hole. So good for you for doing that, because I know as well that, uh, you know, especially in those days when uh, we didn't have to declare all our tips. Men working in bars <laughs> was quite, uh, you know, I made a lot of money too in bars. It was uh, very lucrative um, until I guess, yes, you realize the environment that comes with it. Um, but anyway, enough about us. Let's bring in our speaker and I will leave you the honor of introducing her because I know she's a good friend of yours. Absolutely. So it's such a pleasure. Um, so when I think of Liz, I think of, um, I definitely think of parent. I definitely think of uh, a woman who's, because I've watched this kind of journey. And honestly, you know, I, you know, I came in on the back end, you know, when you're running the marathon and you come in on that last quarter, I think I really came into her life on that last quarter where she was just starting to sense her own sense of worthiness and so as shaky as she was, like literally her voice would shake sometimes when we talk, um, she reached out to me on a social media platform. And I think we became like what I call instant soul safe sisters. Um, so people that have kind of had the same kind of, you know, experience, kind of like when I met Caroline and you just know that you have a, a friendship of duration and, you know, I'm in Vancouver and she's in London. And, um, and so we just started this relationship. And so I've been able to watch this last quarter um, and Caroline and I both, I mean, are such advocates and we're kind of the people that will get behind and help push people no matter what, when we know that they're pushing towards something for themselves. And I think Caroline, you nailed it on the head, how difficult it can be sometimes when you want it for someone else. So here, here's the, here's the ace in the deck, because, you know, there are 52 cards and everybody's at different stages. And then you've got those people that are really ready and um, all they need is actually bumper railing. They don't even need you to push them because something inside already switched. The switch flipped already. And I met her at that flip switching stage. Um, so I'm going to let her tell her own story. But this woman just had her first ever book launch that both myself and Caroline were honored to be on. I was blown away that she gave me the honor of being able to write the foreword to her book. And as a woman who's had to overcome something very similar to what she experienced, because I don't think, I think it's the same for everybody, but never the same for everybody. Um, it was really an honor to do that part of my healing process for sure. And I just know that this book is, this is, this book needs to be in everyone's hands because if we don't think we need to read it ourselves, there's always a part of us that could do a, that could move more forward in empowerment, but also we know somebody that we should be lending that book out to fairly regularly. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let Liz introduce herself and tell us a little bit of your story, Liz, and what it, what the name of your book is and why you decided to name your book that and 
kind of introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? Okay, hello. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm well chuffed. It's cool. got that shaky voice a little bit, but we'll go with it. Um, so yeah, I'm um, Liz Hoy, and um, I'm in um, very near to uh, London in the UK. Um, and um, previously, by profession, I've always been um, a teacher um, in in high school. So sort of key stage three, key stage four, GCSE, psychology, health and social care. Um, and that's kind of, you know, been my background. I've also been a, a youth support worker. So I've always kind of um, had that drive to want to do things and want to help and support, um, especially young people um, who were sort of potentially struggling or needed that little bit of extra help and support. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, my my sort of background where I sort of came from. But I've always loved to um, study. Um, a lot of people, my friends kind of like growing up, they would call me the bookworm. I would just always be studying. That would be my thing. Put me put me at home with um, an episode of Columbo um, and, <laughs> and a book to read and I was sold. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and then, you know, obviously things happen and, you know, your life starts to um, take turns and go through different avenues that you didn't necessarily expect that you would find yourself in. Um, and and kind of here I am now sort of written my first um, my first book, which is um, called Break Free. Um, and the subtitle of it is um, a transformational journey and paradigm shift out of um, coercive control. Um, and and yeah, it's um, it was based on a, a coercive control and relationship um, sort of over, you know, an 18 year span. And um just to kind of you know for those of you who may not sort of be aware but basically what what coercive control is it's a it's a pattern of um of behavior or a pattern of acts um that's used to create codependency in order to exert control over somebody um usually in sort of intimate relationships um can be family relationships as well those types of things um but there is that um it's the it's the codependency and the exertion of the control to to dominate somebody else um and and I kind of you know went through um that relationship as I say for for 18 years not really understanding what type of relationship I was going through wasn't really aware of it to be quite honest with you um and it wasn't until I started to kind of look at okay I'm, I'm in this relationship but what am I feeling what are the signs and and so I found myself um you know being isolated from from friends and family all my time if I if I was out was being monitored um, you know, loads of phone calls, um, you know, text messages. Where are you? What are you doing? Um, and initially this was like, oh, she's just checking up on me. This this, this is OK. This, you know, he cares. This is great. Um, and but when that kind of happens um, incrementally and over time, um, you kind of you start to feel um, a little bit a little bit different, a little bit odd, but still in the position of not being able to place it anywhere um, because there was there was never a case where where violence was was something that I experienced within the relationship that I would classify. There'd been incidents, but nothing that I would say, oh, you know, I'm being beaten or I'm being hit or raped or anything like that, which is at, which is horrendous in itself. But I couldn't put my finger on what I was going through. Um, and actually, it wasn't until very much later on in the relationship that I then realised because the other things, for example, would be um, financial abuse. I went for a lot of financial abuse. Um, you know, and, uh, strict routines um, that kind of had to be adhered to. Um, and if there wasn't, there was sort of this silent treatment or I wasn't able to do things properly or, you know, the humiliation sort of trying to make out it was a joke, but it wasn't. And eventually it kind of started to break me down. Um, and it wasn't really until 2017 that I kind of really realised what um, what, I was, what I was experiencing in, in, and, and going through. And um, obviously kind of fast forward two years after that, um, kind of came out of that relationship and, and ultimately wrote the book a year later. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where it sort of, you know, started and, and developed and, and th those warning signs and, and the awareness. Hence the reason why I wanted to write the book initially was to spread awareness, but also just help one person um, going through what I was going through because I was kind of reaching out but didn't really know what I was reaching out for because I, I, could, I couldn't put my finger on what it was I just couldn't do it um, and then once I decided to, to write the book I was like I wonder who else feels like this who else is going through this 
Um, and as I said, it was just that one person that I wanted to help because I suffered so badly. Um, I didn't really know what else to do with myself. So I yeah. think that's uh, so courageous, honestly. Um, and, you know, when I listen to your story and read your book, um, I feel like there's part of my relationships that were like that. Yeah. And I think it's hard to identify when it's abuse yeah. and when it's not, because like you said, there's no bruises, there's no yeah. blood, there's no pictures you can take to show. But I honestly think that if I look at my lowest moments in my life, it wasn't when I had a big car accident or when I gave birth or when I was mm. physically, it was when someone was bringing me down my self-esteem and everything. So I find that, you know, women like you to eventually stand up and say it's enough. It's more yeah. than courageous because you must be fighting with your inside voice as well. Like, no, I'm not thinking properly. Oh, it's, all on me and plus being told and being brainwashed but yeah. what was the moment Liz that you know you said because it went on for 18 years yes uh, yeah. well I'm gonna ask you two questions in there did you have okay. people telling you um you know what are you doing or it's not okay that he's treating you this way and then what was the breaking point when yeah. you said enough and you left because that's quite a you know I know you have kids as well so it's yeah. quite a big move to be so I'll yeah answer those two questions yeah so I think for the um you know like you said it, it is that thing and I think two things happened for me when you know that if people were to pose that question first off that question kind of didn't come um wasn't focused on me or wasn't asked a lot because I never really spoke out about it because I wasn't quite sure and as I say I kind of you know got um we got together in 2001 and it was by 2017 um and it wasn't actually until I did my master's which was a massive um transition for me that I was able to talk to people doing that course who had then advised me about what I was going through um who had been um you know people working in law enforcement so it it, that question for me wasn't really there because I didn't speak out and there were only two people that actually really knew um, the in-depth of, of what I was going through but equally didn't really understand the true nature of it um, and then another important point that you were you were just talking about Caroline is the fact that you, you know you have what's going on inside internally um, but you have the external world so while the external world and people were saying, looking in at my life, going, oh, my gosh, oh, you're so lucky. Oh God, he takes the children away on on holiday. Oh, my other half wouldn't have a clue. God, you don't have to do any Christmas shopping. You don't have to do any wrapping. But actually, those were the things that were taken away from me. Um, so I wasn't you know, it wasn't my remit to do the Christmas shopping. It had to be done right. It, I wasn't trusted to do it because of how my capabilities was described. Um, so I always had that pull inside of me thinking, Hmm, why, why am I not being grateful for this? You know, other people are seeing him as, as this wonderful person. And that kind of, um, that was really hard for me to, um, to accept, but equally because there was so much gaslighting um, that happened. And, and for those people who, who are not sure, you know, as, as to what gaslighting is, it's basically the distortion of your own reality. So I had that going on as well. Um, so I didn't trust myself. I couldn't even you know really think straight in terms of if I'd put something somewhere you know he'd always used to take my keys and you know things like that so I was kind of in my own head not really knowing if I could trust myself and then you have the external going god your life is brilliant you live in this lovely place and I'm like hmm I don't I don't really know what I'm feeling so because people weren't aware of what I was feeling and I wasn't talking about it because I couldn't pinpoint it which made that really tricky um and and kind of to answer you know your second question and you know what what was that point I think it was making that decision and I did a speech at the World Coach and Leadership Summit on the 10th of May and, and it was entitled a decision can shift a paradigm and that was because I was always wanted to do a master's even as a young child I had like images and visions of me on stage with a scroll but as a child and I always had that so when I came to make that decision um in 2017 I said oh I really want to do a master's I think his response just shocked me and it said if you and he said if you do a master's it's going to be the end of this relationship 
And I was like, oh, really? And, but yeah, and it was like, you, you can't cope. You're not going to be able to cope. Why are you doing this? You, you're not going to be able to cope. You're not going to be able to work and do both and, and work. My previous job as, as the youth sport had contacted me and said, do you want to do a part time teaching job? So these opportunities were happening for me, but I wasn't being supported. You know, he kind of wanted me to stay in that traditional stay at home, um, you know, mother type role. And I was like, why do you why are you not supporting me on this? And but the 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 wonderful thing now when I look back on Caroline is the fact that it wasn't just um, a decision, it was a desire. I always had the desire to do a master, so it wasn't something that I could just let go. It wasn't something I was prepared to lay down and go, no, 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 no I'm, I'm, oh, okay, don't worry about it. I couldn't do that with this because I was so wanting to do it. I desired to do it. Um, and actually, that really was was the massive transformation when I did this master's, because even though I went through, I mean, it cut off, you know, the Wi-Fi, so I couldn't, you know, have access to to printing things or my keys would be stolen right before presentation. So, you know, I would kind of be all panicked when I arrived. And, and I, in my head, I thought, I've got to do this for two years and I'm battling against this for two years. This shouldn't be right. This should be somebody should be supporting me with it, with this with this dream of mine. Um, and it wasn't like that. And for me, I then questioned why somebody would be so threatened that I would want to do that th those things for myself. Why would someone be so threatened to, you know, to to want to not want to allow me to go out and, and earn my own money? And that was massive warning signs. And then also the support of the people who were on the course. And my master's was in crime and community safety evidence based practice. So these people were kind of within law enforcement, and they were like, "Hang on a minute." <laughs> and that's when they kind of. Um, kind of pinpointed to me look this is have a look at this um, because they used to see the amount of text messages that used to come through on my phone while I'd be trying to study so I'd just end up packing all the books away um, and just going home because I was just so I just couldn't concentrate it just dominated me so much um, and so so yeah I mean it's that, that that for me was was the turning point and that for me was this person doesn't um, doesn't love me and support me um, not how I need to be um, for this stage in my life um, and ultimately that's when I you know made the decision um, in 2008 December um, that enough was enough and and I was going to do it um, and, and 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 actually it was really it was it was the masters because I always thought that I was protecting the children I always thought that they didn't see this or that they didn't hear it because they were young at the time um, and actually, it's not until recently now that I realise how much they did remember from that time. Um, but equally, it's, you know, it's not something that I can change now. But again, something that, you know, something that we can all sort of be aware of, you know, with children, they are really susceptible to their environment. Um, and, and and if I had had that knowledge, then I probably would have left sooner, um, if, I'm, if I'm honest. But because I thought I was doing a good job and I thought that I was, I was trying to keep a family together, um, because I, I never wanted to have, you know, a broken home for my children. I always wanted to keep that sort of close knit family, um, but ultimately not not at the expense of um, of my mental health and certainly not at the expense of my children. So. So, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, that's very incredible. And there were so many things in there that I'd love to just heighten. But you said a word that I don't think very many people have an understanding of. I think I that. When people are listening, they can relate either to themselves or to a family member or to a sister or to a daughter or to themselves. Like, mm -hmm. wow, I've had someone take my voice away. We all know what it's like when someone's like, I mean, I remember when I went to start an aromatherapy company and one of my dearest friends, like, why would you do like, no one, no one's ready for that. And inside I'm like, you know, then I went and did it. There's yeah. those small little pieces of non-support. And then you've got the big stuff. And you got the big stuff where someone is physical or the neighbors are talking or your girlfriend pulls you aside and go, I just can't watch you go back into this relationship. Um, yeah. You know, it's not serving you. And, and that's there's so many different levels of what you say. I remember you sharing a story with me once about how he really was derogatory towards a part of your body, towards your feet and how that really impacted you and how you didn't think you had beautiful feet because he insulted your feet. I mean, all of those very like they're not they don't sound subtle to me. When you said that yeah. to me, but for you, it's like, oh my gosh, those shoes don't look good on you kind of thing. And just how it is like little bit by little bit by little bit. It's kind of like, you know, compound interest. But you yeah. said something that I said a lot of people I don't think understand. And that's financial abuse, right? Because yeah. our finances are 
like when people think about why I'm staying, a lot of what comes up for people that want to go is how am I going to support myself? Where am I going to get this? How am I going to feed my kids? Can you elaborate a little bit on what, because someone might be going, oh, that stuck for me. But I remember when I first heard from one of my girlfriends that she was on an allowance and I was like, and I almost like held my stomach. Now, I didn't know whether that was a healthy, like, hey, this is how much is separated from the family income for me to go do stuff or whether this was, this is all you get and you don't see more. I, you yeah. know, that was an exploratory conversation. But what does financial, what did financial abuse look like for you? Um, so, yeah, so for me, it was, there was a very similar, um, you know, to your friend, there was um, a certain amount of um, money that was, that was paid into my account. Um, and that was very little. And that was to basically to for me to just survive for the month. Um, anything I needed, anything I wanted. Um, but it was it was it was always leaving me to the point where I kind of, you know, I literally just could do the basic, the basics. So there was no extras for, you know, going out or socializing or, or anything, which which actually in turn um, feeds that um, that isolation from from friends and, and, and family in that respect. Um, and so that that was always quite um, controlled um, in, and that made things really difficult. Um, and. But because he was in because he had the money and he was in so, so much control over that, you then start thinking about finances dif differently. Like you said, what am I going to do? How am I actually going to get out of this situation? Hence the reason why I wanted to get the part time work. I wanted to do the masters and I wanted to be able to earn my own money. Um, and as soon as that started to um, come to the foe, it was it, that's when things started to change. So it was almost um, a compulsion to keep me where I was, um, to give me this allowance, um, to almost make me want more or to make me need more. But rely on him, as I was saying, within the definition, it's about creating that codependency. You don't feel like you can break free on your own because you have this in the back of your head. What am I going to do if I've got children? How am I going to support my children if? Um, and so that kind of for me was um, it just encompassed how um, financial abuse was was exerted over me. And then but but equally, when I wanted to then um, eradicate that and get rid of that um, to start work, um, the amount of um, pit holes and um, sabotage that was put in place in order to prevent me from earning that money and going that step further to be able to be um, self-sufficient. Um, was was almost an onslaught in itself um, in terms of you know me earning and finances. Um, so yeah, I think the whole um, for me the whole issue around you know financial abuse and, and financial control um, has you know was very evident within the relationship. Um, but equally, when I tried to do something to change that you then, you know, you're then faced with that almost, they, they sort, of, sort of saw it as disrespect. How dare you think that you can do this? Because if you do a master's, you might earn more than me. And that was that fear inside of him that he just didn't want to, he didn't want to allow. Um, so I think for me, that's what made the whole kind of financial abuse really tricky in my situation. And, uh, you know, I think there's really a stigma um, behind all of this. And it's so hard to you know, I want to have an opinion on certain things, but for me, this is so hard. Like women who stay home or men who stay home, you know, there's now men who stay yeah. home and the woman work. But I mean, when, yeah. the, when the two parents are not working, it's so difficult because it almost seems like one is making money and the other one is the other one mm -hmm. isn't, but it's not that it's like one is raising the family and has that job that is yeah. not attached to an hourly wage and the other one does. And yeah. anyway, that's probably another complete different podcast, but I'm really hoping there's going to be, you know, with time, we're going to evaluate and that women who choose to stay home won't have to face that. Um, so yeah. I, I guess that's just a comment because when you say that, it's like literally my heart ache uh, yeah. because I know how it feels, but I really, yeah. really want to, um, you know, show here and really um you know uh, looking for my word here I really want to take a minute to say how strong you are and yeah. I really think that people have to read your book because we think 
that these things happen when you're weaker, when you're not educated, when uh, when this, when that, when that, and it's not true. Like you, just the fact that you had a vision when you were a kid of saying, I'm going to do my master. Mm-hmm. Um, I did university and I did less than a master and gosh, it was hard. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, is hard. it takes discipline. It takes consistency. It takes, you really need to be determined to put that amount of work for two years uh, yeah. that, you know, may give you something. So you, you did all of that plus fighting someone who was telling you don't do it, but yeah. I really want you to, you know, acknowledge yourself for sticking to your dream. Cause maybe yeah. at some point you were, you know, this, um, this person that was hurt and abused, but there was the other side of you who stayed the strong woman of, you know, there is my limit. And I like to say that we always have garden angels um, Mm. that loves us and won't let us fall too deep. So there's always a limit there. And so the strong woman in you just came back and was like, no, no, no. You know, I think we wake up one day and we're like, okay, I am worth this at least <laughs> even if yeah we're yeah worth it we're worth this at least so what you know in your book what do you go through really and without giving up the book uh, but just tell us um you know why would should people read it to understand that it can happen to anyone and it's very sneaky mm. and you know yeah, I think I think for me, it's, you know, as I said, it was I, I always wanted to when I first came out of the relationship in um, when I moved out with, with the children in October, October 2019. Um, I, I wanted to write the book there and then I wanted to um, spread awareness of coercive control um, because I had gone through this relationship for so many years, but couldn't pinpoint what I was going through because I didn't kind of fit that typical mold of, you know, B&B and rates and all the other horrendous things that, that, that come along with that type of abuse. And I, I kind of was like, well, I don't even know why, um, what, what's happened. I don't even know where my head is with this. So that's why I initially wanted to write the book because I wanted to spread awareness of coercive control. What is it? What are the signs? How do you know if you're in that type of relationship? Um, And then I then also thought to myself, okay, if I can reach one other person to help and support them with the tools that I have used for myself, um, then I, I, I would have started the momentum in the right direction. And that's, that was my, that was my basis and I think for me um and and obviously it you know you'd have to kind of you know you, it, it's it's great to read the book because it's it it goes through coercive control but it also looks at you know different aspects of um situations and experiences that happen in in your life that you don't necessarily realize so it kind of is that light bulb moment you're like oh my gosh that's happened to me that's happened to me that's happened to me um and and then it kind of you know looks at tools as well that you could use um in order to help yourself um and feel worthy and 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 I remember always asking myself one question um because I kept reading a lot about self-care and I kept thinking what is self-care and even though I read about it I watched um you know YouTube um like clips on it what is self-care and I couldn't I couldn't do that for myself and so for me what I did I kind of you know exchanged it so I thought okay how do I want to show up for my girls that's where I started in terms of self-care the self-care is as you know as we know it you know you've got to look after yourself it's it's things that you can do for yourself to help yourself to make yourself feel, feel better um which is um which is separate from um an outside agency sort of helping you as such with with any support um tools or mechanisms and so I said to myself I couldn't do that so I can do that how do I do that for my children and that's where I started but it was about trying to focus um on the inner game and pay less attention to what was happening externally um in order to find a way to um to 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 be happy and and I couldn't even start with the word happy that's how you know that's just like testament to how low I was I couldn't start with happy I didn't even know what be happy was um 
because I, I was almost the master at, at, at hiding how I felt. I would smile, I would laugh, I would, I would compensate. Um, and so I think that um, the book is, is grounded in the sense that it has the awareness, it has the tools, um, but equally it has that, um, you know, kind of getting rid of that blame and resentment um, in order to be able to move on with your life um, and, and actually accept that, you know, try to focus your energy on where you want to go as opposed to where you are now um and 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 I think for me that 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 was massive and and, and it's the hope that you know when other people read the book that um they can they can feel empowered um by you know reading my story reading my journey um and seeing that you know what things are hard but actually sometimes being in your place of rock bottom is the best place to start um and it's about reframing a lot of the experiences that you go through um to something that can serve you and you can use to your advantage um as opposed to looking at your situation and going this isn't fair this isn't right um because it puts you in a totally different vibration it puts you in a totally different focus and 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 another thing from the book i kind of wanted to bring in the you know the, the spiritual and the scientific in terms of how how focused our thoughts can be in different areas and and the importance of that um considering how many thoughts we have a day um, and where our energy is focused and i think it kind of um it reaches to so many people and, and i say you know the start of the book this is this is for this is for anyone but equally it can be for all aspects of your life um in terms of you know making sure that the inner game is is the only game that you can play and ultimately the only game that you can win so yeah. It's incredible. The one beautiful thing that, well, there's many beautiful things that I love that you touched on. Um, not only the impact of how it's going to help people that would 100% relate to what it is, whatever the title they use it, whether it's like mm -hmm. abusive relationships or whatever, and bits and pieces, like we hear it out there. There's large groups that have, you know, labeled like narcissistic relationships or passive aggressive relationships or controlling relationships but when I listen to you share there are aspects of those that end up under this title of curse of control which I don't think a lot of us have heard about and so sometimes we can justify oh well you know she's just a little bit controlling or he's just a little narcissistic he likes the attention on him or you know it's normal in marriage or relationship to not have everything that you like or of course they're supportive here but not here in that whole it's like a scale, right? Scale, good, bad, not, she makes me, he makes me, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that when, I think what you're explaining is when it gets painful to you. Yeah, and when absolutely. you when you had something that was so valuable to you that yeah. you couldn't believe that someone wasn't, because this had been such a dream, whatever it is for you, you know, whatever it is for people, like sometimes it's a job, it's a parent, it's your kids. And I love how you talk about how you started self-caring yourself to be a model for your children because i think so many of us get it together no matter what's yes. going on and we break free from ourselves because we don't we, we are not at the place where we care about us 100 percent, but we sure care about our little our little beings right yeah. and there's this overwhelming we need to be better people whether you put in parent owner business person role model whatever it is and i love that you bring up the issue of self-care because for a lot of people people think self-care is going to the spa they do they're like oh pampering yourself which is just out of my budget or out of my sphere but you're talking about self-care like eating well reading mm. well listening well having people in your life that are happy for you healthy for you I think the least expensive form of self-care that anyone can do is look at who you're hanging with yeah, like absolutely. honestly, it doesn't cost any money to add a friend or delete one. I mean, we do it on Facebook all the time, don't we? So it doesn't cost a lot of money. I mean, you sourced me out on LinkedIn, right? I mean, here we are. <laughs> so you, know, you hounded your publisher there, right? So self-care doesn't have to be a three-hour treatment getting a facial. Now, please, everybody go do it because we all deserve it, men, women. And we are now taking our kids to go get their nails done, right? But self-care is a critical baseline of knowing how much you care about yourself because it doesn't cost necessarily a lot of money and um eating good food you know we and caroline we talk about putting you know putting you know i talk about herbs and sugar-free and we put up good products and healthy and all those things are parts of our life 
and how that's important for ourselves. So I really love that you touched on the self-care and, um, you know, we could talk about, you know, this for a long time. I think you were so comprehensive in talking about what your book entails and um, that people should read it and have it on hand. I think healthcare, you know, practitioners and anyone who's in health and wellness, anyone who's in psychology, anyone who's like, you know, that whole Joe Dispenza, Tony Robbins, Oprah, Brene Brown, you know, Ellen DeGeneres, all of those people really should read your book because it's always inspiring to hear somebody overcome. It's yeah. always inspiring. When I hear you overcome your situation, it's going to help me go out there and exercise like I need to do it, right? It's a, it's a positive vibe. You know, you want to align with positive vibe. I love the word reframing, reframing what happens to us in a way that we can take something from it and become stronger, better, stronger, better, stronger, better. But please tell us what is next for you. You just launched this book, right? You've just <laughs> launched this book. I know Caroline's got another question for you, but I was going to say, you've just launched this book. And yeah. you are in the process of that. That alone would be uncomfortable. That alone, putting in your personal life, there's a lot of people I know that do books that write it in someone else's name, right? And so you've put it into your name. Your yeah. family has read this. Your friends have read this. God knows the person that you spent time with has probably read it. <laughs> what was it like to go through the process of coming out? And what... And, and so where are you at in that? And then where, you know, where, where, where is Liz going? Where are you yeah. going? Girl, where are you going, girl? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the whole, like, you know, you, like you asked the whole process of, of coming out, you know, just writing the book. And, and, and I, I remember, you know, contacting my, um, my, my book publisher, um, Tanya Coley and just going, okay, I want to write this book. It's been a year now because it took me a year, if I'm honest, yeah 13 months before I was actually ready to write the book because I was so I had um, resentment and anger and all of those emotions going on um, and so when I you know initially kind of wrote the book I was very much um, focused on I, I knew exactly what I wanted to write um, I knew exactly how it wanted to be and and I, I wrote the book in 90 days and, and obviously that you know you have a process as you know that it's the editing isn't it afterwards that kind of you know sort of takes the time and um, and so uh, you know I did go through stages where I was like oh my gosh like I can't do this well I can't say that or I can't say that and you know I'm really worried about what what I was what I was going to say and but there was never a question of um, you know, maybe using somebody else's name. I, I wanted this to to be my story. I wanted to this. I wanted this to be a different story that I was telling the universe. I wanted it to. Um, I wanted it to reach people who 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 understood what it was like to go through those relationships. And because that was what I wanted initially, like I said, it was only about one person, but I knew it would start the momentum. And so it was so important for me that over that overrided those feelings of, oh, my gosh, I'm worried about this. I'm nervous about this. So what happens if this happens? Oh, gosh, if I have I said too much. But even though I had those feelings, it was far more important for me to spread awareness and help people and serve other people because I knew that I wanted to have a three month program, um, which would go in line with the book that was always in my head. And so actually those feelings of, of worry and, um, and that procrastination about it was, was outweighed by awareness, helping and supporting other people. It, was, it always came down to what could I do to, to, to help somebody pinpoint what they're feeling, identify what it is, and then be free to make a choice. And that was it for me. I, I didn't have that. Um, I didn't feel I had a choice because I didn't know what I was going through. And it wasn't until I identified it that I could say, ah, I've got that choice now. Um, and and I, I took my damn sweet time. <laughs> um, but equally, again, in reframing that, um, I was I was, you know, sifting and sorting as such through um, through life to be able to to find the relationship that I'm now in and where I truly feel I found my soulmate. So I kind of look at that in terms of like what we say, reframing it um, in, a, in a positive way um, that's, you know, you know, great now. And, you know, I've got um, so many kind of supportive people around me, um, which which is great. And. And so, yeah, that was that's that's where that's what I kind of wanted. And so there was that worry of, um, you know, putting me out there. Um, but equally, that got over overrided by by wanting to help and serve others. Um, and then the program in line with it as well. And 
um, which which again is what I wanted to do because I wanted to be able to share the tools that worked for me because I couldn't find anything out there that would work for me. I did the Freedom Program um, and it was just at the start of COVID, so that got cut short. Um, and that actually left me in the place of, so what do I do now? Where do I go now? Okay, I've got to go in here. Um, I've got to go, I've got to go inside. I've got to pay attention to how I feel inside. I've got to take full control over my life um, and concentrate on the thoughts that I think because what was coming to, into my experience was based on the thoughts I kept thinking that was just affecting um, my experience. And it was, it was through that, that I had to get the focus. And once I got that focus, everything else started to, to fall in place um, and, and, and allowed me to continue, I like to say continue on my journey of, um, of healing and empowerment because I, I don't believe we're, we're ever done. Um, I truly don't. So, um, but then following from that, so um, my next um, book is going to be um, called Some Awesome Things Kiddies Could Say to Feel Empowered. Um, and because I think that's really important in terms of, you know, so many times I wanted to talk to my girls and I wanted to tell them um, and give them tools to support them. But I was so worried about, you know, slating the other parent and, and coming across in a negative way. Um, you know, most of the time I said nothing um, and I didn't do um, me or the girls um, didn't, you know, didn't do them a great service by doing that. So um, I wanted to make sure that, um, that that this process involved children as well, because ultimately that type of behaviour filters down um to the children so the next book is going to be um about you know children there is a little help script um within the book but I want to extend on that um and 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 help children to feel empowered by um you know the things that they can mm. say and sometimes the questions they can ask as well um and yeah I'm, I'm on on the 11th of um September I've got a speaking engagement for um for Des O'Connor um in London so I'm really chuffed about that that's going to be my kind of first on stage um speaking event um yeah talking about a decision can shift a paradigm and um and and yeah so my speech speech for that is coming up and yeah just kind of doing podcasts and you know always developing myself as in personal development like I said I love reading um I love, love listening to the to the old the old greats you know Neville Goddard and 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 people like that so um so yeah all, all positive all onwards and upwards but still you know just pushing through those fears day, daily because they're always going to be there I just mix it up a little bit with faith now which makes a whole difference to my life <laughs> I'm so happy to to hear that. And there's one thing that I really hear from you is that, and I'm sure the process is not finished, but you have healed. You know, there are some people that will get out of some situations, but they don't really have mm -hmm. time to go through the process. So yeah. they keep carrying it with them. Like they'll stay single for the rest of their life because yeah. like, never again will I trust them in. Yeah, no, you really, you really moved on. And that in itself is beautiful. And, you know, the fact that you moved on, I have to say was also beautiful for your daughters, because you not only uh, thought them that this is not okay, but you also thought them without realizing it that they have to put themselves first, you know, yeah. you have to be okay. And you guys were talking about self care. For me, when I hear all the description of self-care that you, you give, I hear self-worth because mm. when you think you're worth it, you will do the self-care that goes with it. So I think it's a, a beautiful journey that you're going through. And thank you so much for sharing it with everyone. And thank you. <laughs> I'm really happy that actually there's a book that will be talking about kids, your next book. And um, because like I told you in pre-interview, for me, when these situations happen, whatever kind of situation, when it's, it, it happens to a family, I'm always thinking about the kids and how is it going to impact them later on? Uh, because as parents, clearly, we want to shelter them from everything and we want the best for them. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we fail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm happy that there's also that other book that comes. Uh, but I really encourage everyone to get Liz Oit's 
book, which is called Break Free. You can yep. find it on Amazon. Uh, is there yep. any other place you, we can find it? Please? Yeah, it's on, um, yeah, so Amazon. Um, you can get obviously the paperback or, or the Kindle version um, on, on Amazon. And it's also available in, in Waterstones as well. Um, there's a couple of other sites and it's just gone out of my head, but those are probably okay. <laughs> those are the main things. But yeah, it's, um, yeah. So Liz Hoyt Break Free and also, you know, anything that anyone wants to know or any events um that people want to book or hire me for for speaking engagements whether it's a small group or a large group um you can get all of that information off um my website which is lis l-i-s really what uh dot com <laughs> so um that's so, so cool yeah. cool title yeah. <laughs> lis really what yeah just lis really what dot com um and then yeah you can find out you know all stuff booking appointments for the program one-to-one or group coaching so yeah it's all it's all there so um yeah it's just about trying to just yeah I encourage everyone to visit the website uh because I think that what Liz touches on impacts all of us in different ways and at different level so I'm going to tell you my piece. Thank you so much for being here. It was an honor. Thank uh, you. I have close the show because she has this thing about wanting to have the last word. So okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Liz. It was nice to see you. And uh, I will follow you for sure. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Awesome. That was amazing. And I think, you know, um, without making it sound like a fairy tale, because we know that it wasn't, you know, this is no princess in the pea. This is no Cinderella, Romeo, Juliet story. This is real life, real stuff. Yeah. And I think, but it is um, so hopeful for people to hear that you are now in a, can I say a loving relationship. Yes. Um, yes. You have found yourself and then you have found someone that honors who you are and who you feel you are today. And you yeah. are about to embark on a new journey in that experience. Right. And yeah. so um, I don't, you know, um, so that's a, that's a whole other, you know, maybe we'll talk about that with your kid's book. There might be a reason why Liz is writing a kid's book. Yes, and it's right incredible. Me. And it's yeah, incredible. It so, <laughs> yeah. So leave that. But what I, <laughs> we'll leave that. Um, I know I have, a, you know, I've been telling Caroline that me and Caroline, as the world changes, are going to be getting ourselves on stage very soon. And I can absolutely see you rocking the stage with us and sharing some of your story. And I did want to say not only thanks to Liz, but anyone is out there listening, not only go to Liz for all of the things that she talked about, but if you have a story or if there's something that you're doing, whether it's nonprofit, profit, if you're a lifepreneur, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to come have this experience and hang out with me and Caroline, then please contact us because it's our mission to empower entrepreneurs. It's our mission to empower people that make change, game changers, lifepreneurs, whatever you want to call yourself. We'd love to have you on the show. And we also have other platforms. We are, our, our book launch is October 1st for, you know, a, an anthology of 20 powerful women in business that are sharing their stories much like this and how they got themselves to high level success, both income and personal development. Um, that launch is October 1st. And so we invite anyone who wants to have a VIP message to that, please let us know. We'd love to have you. And Liz, you absolutely need to be there. Lovely. And, Thank you. Um, and then we also have this incredible planner and this planner that we have and Liz, you need to be in this planner as well is we have, um, we started off, we don't have as that many left, but I'm just going to say, cause that's the number in my head. We have over 100 spots for people that are game changing, life changing and personal development or business, or you're just out there and you got something to say, you know, instead of making those memes, we have quote spots available in this ultimate entrepreneur planner so it's a planner full of personal and business development um, that helps people in their business and their lives and we wanted to open up so we literally made spots in our planner for some people to say what it is that they want to come say so um that's kind of our dharma that's what we do for our service um and uh we just love working with people that have your vibe and so anyways, people, you know how to contact us. Just contact us, right? Uh, the True That Show. Um, so it was a pleasure to have you. Do you have any last words before we final off and send out this amazing podcast and, and uh, <laughs> video to the world? Yeah, I'd just like to say that, you know, within any type of relationship, in any type of relationship, what we can always, what we can always guarantee and what we can always 
um, trust is is our emotional guidance. And and I think I ignored mine for so many years, but I'm I'm really chuffed to be able to sit here and say um, when when we rely on that um, and we and we feel how we feel, we can never be wrong for how we feel. So if something doesn't feel right, it that's okay. Trust your instinct. Trust your gut. Um, I ignored I ignored mine for many years, but equally that that's the one thing that we can rely on is our emotional guidance system. Definitely.